Welcome to the first screencast on recursion. So what is recursion? Basically, it is a way of solving problems by breaking them into smaller problems. So we break it down until we get to a simplest or a simple problem that we can solve immediately and then we recombine the results from that simple one to solve the larger one to solve the next larger one until we've solved the entire problem. It's a powerful way of problem solving that works for certain kinds of problems but not all. The general rec algorithm for doing recursion is if you can solve the problem from some value of n, perhaps a size or something, you solve it and you're done. You've solved the problem. One step. If you can't solve it for a value of n, you try to recursively or try the same algorithm to a smaller size problem, so a smaller n. And then once you've solved the smallest one, you combine the solutions to all those smaller problems together to solve the large problem. So for example, if we want to get the length of a string, we can do it recursively. So if the string is empty, its length is zero. If the string's not empty, then the length is one plus the length of the string that you ignore the first character of. So you strip off the first character, and that's why you have the one, and then you get the length of the rain remaining string, which is smaller. So eventually the string will be zero, but the link, you'll get down to small, but you just start adding those up. So zero plus one plus one, and you do that n times, and you will get the correct length of the subscreen. So here's the Java code that implements that particular length method. It takes a string, it checks to see if the string is null or equals the empty string. If so, it returns zero. If it's not null or not equal to the empty string, you return one plus the length, you call the same method again, of the string and you strip off the first character of the string and you supply the rest of it. So this, using calling the length method inside of the length method is what recursion is in Java. So how does Java manage this calling a method inside of a method inside of a method thing? Well, a Java maintains a runtime stack for all method calls called activation frames. So every time you call a method in Java, it creates an activation frame. An activation frame contains all the method arguments that you're calling the method with, any local variables, the all the local variables that are available at the time you call the method, and the return address of where the program is going to continue executing when we return from that method call. So we, we keep track of all the local state, we know what the parameters are, and we know where we're coming back to when the method returns. So let's do an example of tracing that length method that we just talked about when we calculate the length of the string ace. So someone called length with the string ace. So on the right hand side you can see the runtime stack shows the length ace call, the parameter that it was passed in ace, and it remembers the return address of who called this method. So on the left hand side you see that we keep track of the string. The base case in our recursive algorithm is false, so what do we do? We return one plus, and we call the method length on the string CE. So what does that do? It causes a, another method call, another activation record to be pushed onto the runtime stack. We know that the string is now, for this method, the string is CE, and we were returning to the length ace call, so we were returning to the length ace call right before the plus. So we, what do we do in the length CE? Our string is CE, base case is false. So what do we do? We return one plus the length of E, which creates another call, method call. There's another activation record pushed onto the runtime stack. Its this parameter string is E. Return address is into the length CE method and if we look at it string is e base case is false so we call return of one plus length of an empty string and so we push that activation record onto the runtime stack 
the string is empty, so the base case is true, so we return zero. And when we return zero, that pops the activation record off of the runtime stack, and we get the value zero for the length of empty string. So now we can add one to zero and return one in the length E method. So when we return one, excuse me, when we return one, we pop the length E off the activation stack, or the runtime stack, and now we have a one coming in, and noted by the red one in the Z. So what do we do? We add one to that, return that, so now we've got a two in the link CE, we return one and we pop that off and we return to whoever called length of the string ace and we return the value three. So that's how we do recursion. We're calling the same method again and again with smaller and smaller problems until we can solve it easily and then we return unrolling the activation records to get the combined length or the solution by combining the individual calls. So how would we compute n factorial? Well, if n equals zero, then n factorial is one by definition. Else n factorial is equal to n times n minus one factorial. So we've made this problem smaller by saying n minus one and it's factorial. So now we can do it recursively by calling the factorial on n minus 1 and then multiplying by n. So here's the Java code. Again, we have a method factorial that takes an n. If n is 0, we simply return 1. Else if n is not 0, we return n. And then we recursively call the factorial method on n minus 1. So eventually, as long as n is positive, we will get to n is 0 and then the activation records will pop back up and I'll show you that now. So factorial three, base case is false. You can see we have a runtime stack for the person who called factorial three. We call factorial two, push that activation record onto the stack, call factorial one, push that activation record onto the stack, call factorial zero. We return one, popping the activation record off the stack. We now have the answer for factorial zero, so we can multiply that by one return the answer one. Now we have two times one is two. We return that, we pop that method off. Two times, or three times two is six, and we're gonna pop off that one. And then we return to whoever called factorial with the correct answer of six. So how do we do some other recursive algorithms? So for example, if we want to calculate x to the n, where n is greater than zero, if n is zero, the answer is one, else the answer is x times x raised to the n minus one. So we're calculating the power of a smaller problem. And so this is just recursively, eventually n will be zero, and we return one and we'll pop it, all the activation records off the stack. And so again, the method in Java double power takes a double x, the n power that we're raising it to, if n is zero, we return one, else we return x times the power of x raised to the n minus one. And so we'll have the activation records until we get to zero, and then we'll pop them all back up the stack and we'll get the correct answer. Calculating the greatest common denominator, m and n, a common denominator between m and n, m is greater than n, so if n is a divisor of m, then the result, the answer is n. If it's not a divisor of m, m is, n is not a divisor of m, then the greatest common denominator of m and n is n, the greatest common denominator between n and m mod n. Now, n will be larger than m mod n because m mod n is between 0 and n minus 1. So we've made this, the problem smaller. And eventually we will get to the case where n is a divisor of m and we'll return that value. Here's the Java code for that. I have a typo. It should be power. It should be gcd. So 
type on my slide. So we take the GCD of M and N. If M mod N is zero, so that N is a factor of M, we return N. If M is less than N, it's greater than, we swap them because the N value must be larger, the first value must be larger than the second value. If it's not, if N is less than M, then we can do the mod and that will give us the recursive solution to our problem. That first if statement here, sorry, this if statement is just in case someone gave, did not put them the M's and N's in the correct order. So recursion is very similar to iteration in that recursion, you're executing a body of codes you repeatedly by calling the method again and again and again. And so you can see that on the left side, we're returning n times something a bunch of times. And looping is similar where we have a body or compound statement that we do a bunch of times. So result is going to be result times k as many times as we need to. The difference between the two is that one difference is recursion, you stop when you're, you're looking for a base case that you know the answer and you can return. So that stops, in effect, the number of the things you're doing. Um, whereas in looping, you stop or you continue to loop when some condition, the k is less than or equal to n. So when, while that is true, you continue to loop, you don't stop in recursion when the condition is true you stop recursing so but they both give you the same result so whichever how do you choose between using recursion or iteration you basically use whichever one is clearer or easier to understand for example both of these factorial methods calculate factorial correctly to me personally the one on the left the recursive one is easier for me to understand because I under I know the factorial the algorithm for factorial is basically a recursive one the iterative one on the left doesn't make as much sense it's not as clear to me that it is correct but if you like loops better than recursion use the iterative one and not the recursive one because recursion can be kind of tricky to your your method is calling the same method with slightly different parameters. It is a different way of thinking about problems. So here's another way of a recursive definition of Fibonacci numbers, which is a sequence of numbers modeling growth. So by definition, the first Fibonacci number is 1, the second Fibonacci number is 1, and the nth Fibonacci number is Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci n minus 2. So that's the recursive call. So we can write the Java program to calculate the Fibonacci, the nth Fibonacci number. So if n is less than 2, we return 1, else we run Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. Now there is an issue with this. There's a huge problem with this. Because we're calling recursion twice, we're a duplicating work so if we do Fibonacci of n minus 1 let's say that n is 5 that's 4 and then we do Fibonacci of n minus 2 which would be 3 well when we call Fibonacci of 4 we'll calculate Fibonacci of n minus 1 which is 3 so we do the Fibonacci of 3 twice so and we're acti we're adding an activation record we're acting two activation records onto the stack for every call of Fibonacci. So the second time through, we're gonna have four activation records pushed on, and then we're gonna have 16, and so it grows very quickly in the number of activation records we're having. And in fact, this algorithm operates at a big O of two to the N, which is a very slow algorithm. There is a better algorithm in the book that you actually keep track of your Ns, and you should take a look at that where you don't have such a horrible performance of calculating the Fibonacci, the nth Fibonacci number. So what are other kind of 
recursive things can we do? One is we can search an array, a linear search of an array, recursively. If the array is empty, then the result is minus one, we didn't find the thing. Or if it's not empty, we check to see if the first element of the array matches the target. If that's true, we return the substrip of the first element of the array that we're searching. If it th doesn't match the target, we search the array excluding the first element. So we search the rest of the array. So we check the first item. If it doesn't match, we move on to the array that is defined by the second item on. So here's an example of the Java code for this linear search, recursive linear search. We have an array of items. We have the target we're looking for. And we're keep track of what position we are looking at. So we will start initially with a position zero. If the position is equal to the length, that means we've gotten to the end, then we did not find the item in the thing, so we return minus one. Else, we check the target to be, is it the item that we're, the first item in our array that we're searching? So if it is, we return the position. Else, we do a linear search for the same array, for the target, but we move the first position. So we start off with zero, and then we're going to use one, and then we'll check that one, and then we'll, the first position, as each time we iter uh, recurse through this, will be one larger until we either get off the end of the array or we find the item. So it's a very simple, it's, you could have done this quite easily in a for loop with going from zero to items length minus one, and it would have the exact same behavior, um, except for you're doing it in a loop instead of calling the method again and again and again. Another recursive search, which is a very powerful search that you should understand, is the binary search. And you can run a search on an array. It does require that the array be sorted so that it's sorted in either ascending or descending order. Uh, normally ascending order, this algorithm is going to be written for an ascending order because that decides which side of the array you look at. So if the array is empty, you did not find the result. Else, you check the middle element of the array to the target. If it matches, then you return the subscript of the middle element. If it doesn't match, you compare the target to the middle item and you decide if the target is less than the middle element, then you search the left half of the array recursively. If it's greater than, you search the right half of the array. So you're dividing the array in half each time you call the recursion. So then eventually you will get either get to an empty array or you will find the item. So here's the Java code. We Again, we have our array of items. It does have to be sorted our comparable target, so we can actually get a less than or greater than, because the comparable interface says that you have the compare to method. The compare to method returns negative if it's the item's less than, it returns zero if it's equal, or it returns positive if it's greater than. So the first thing is, you check to see is last greater than first, or excuse me, first is greater than last. If it is, you have searched the entire array, or you've gone down to the point where you've the array is empty, so you return minus one, you didn't find it. If we, if we still have an array to search, we calculate the middle item that we want to compare. We do the comparison of the target to the item, the middle item, and if the comparison is zero, then we've found the item, and we return the index of the item in the array. If the comparison is negative, then we need to search the left half of the array. So we provide the, the array, the target, the first, and now we search from first to middle minus one. So we're searching the left-hand side of the array that we were considering. And so now the next time we come in, first will be the same, middle will now be last, so we have the array. Well, middle minus one is a little less than half. Else, which means comparison is greater than zero, which just means positive. We search the right-hand side, so we search from the items for the target from the middle plus one to the last. So this will 
keep shrinking the array that we're searching, the parts that we're considering, until we either find the item or we that gets to zero and we're done. So those are two different ways to do searching using recursion on the uh, to search an array, search for items in an array. The binary search is very important. So recursion is a way of solving problems. You break down the problems into smaller and smaller problems. You solve the smallest problems and then you combine the results to get the larger problem solution. It does require using a runtime stack to keep track of the method calls and that's how Java does it. And since the stack is first in, last out, that first call will be the last combination. As you saw on the slide when we were calculating the length, that length of ace was pushed on the stack first, so it comes off last and is combined. Thank you for your attention.